Okay, so uh, we wrapped up uh, what we're going to discuss about propellant combustion uh, uh, on Wednesday. Now we're going to start uh, multi-phase uh, combustion. And as I said before, that is a gigantically huge topic. Uh, could easily take two or three classes just in that alone, because uh, that involves spray combustion, uh, dust explosions, uh, coal-fired burners, uh, internal gun ballistics, uh essentially almost all combustion systems sort of almost always fall into this with the exception of a few um so but first um before we get sort of knee deep into that what we'll do is we will review uh today we're going to review a single droplet vaporization uh and then sort of extend that to combustion um and then on monday we will discuss uh, a carbon particle combustion and aluminum particle combustion. Uh, and then the next following two days, uh, we will discuss how to model these uh, types of systems if you have a big old cloud of them. Um, uh, and then also discuss the physics of group effects. And then on the last couple of lectures, we'll discuss some applications. Uh, a, we will, I'll discuss supercritical spray combustion uh, and supercritical droplet. Uh, combustion, uh, just to basically let you know, or just show you some recent results of some really interesting results of mixing layers of liquid hydrogen and non-reacting mixing layers of, uh, of liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen, where they compare the effect of using the full real gas diffusion potential versus the ideal gas-based diffusion potential. And it's really interesting because the results are uh, not even close to the same so it's a uh, so all those little details that uh that we discussed in the beginning of class are now all starting to be used uh, and then we will also uh, circle back and do one little application lecture uh on propellant combustion uh that involves the combustion of rdx and then we can use our knowledge of multi-phase uh of the multi-phase flow equations to describe the bubble formation uh, uh, in the condensed phase. Okay, so are there any questions with that? Okay, and so uh, before we get going, we will discuss, um, basically review the, uh, the vaporization and combustion of a single droplet uh, or particle. And droplet combustion is important for a lot of applications. Uh, it's important for liquid rockets, uh, diesel engines, uh, metallized propellants, as you saw in the video, you saw those burning aluminum droplets lifting off the surface. Um, it's important for explosions, unwanted uh, and also wanted uh, uh, explosions. And <clears throat> then often in propellants and explosives and all sorts of other things, uh, metal particles are often used due to the really high heat of oxidation, which you could sort of think of as a heat of reaction with uh, 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 with air uh, or oxygen. And so here's just a pretty famous table made by uh, my former advisor of a list of different metals uh, and their and their heat of uh, uh, and their heat of oxidation. And then basically a pure carbon particle is sort of right here. Um, and essentially you can see that the that in black here we have the volumetric heats of oxidation. Uh, these metals tend to be very dense, and so and so there's a lot of energy per unit volume, uh, and then the gravimetric is based on mass, uh, which is the sort of hashed lines here. And you can see that um, uh, boron and beryllium have lots and lots and lots of energy, uh, both in a volumetric, uh, both per unit mass and per unit volume. So from a combustion standpoint, they are extremely attractive for combustion systems. But as I said earlier uh, in a lecture, is that beryllium cannot be used because its combustion products are very toxic. Um, as uh, Professor Glassman told one of my colleagues when he was at Princeton, um, is that you could, if you were, well, if you were to use beryllium particles as an additive in a rocket propellant, uh, it would almost be classified as a chemical weapon by just flying it over the enemy, is that the products are extremely toxic. And so beryllium is out uh, as a uh, as a 
uh, as an energetic as an as an energetic additive, which is a shame, because beryllium particles uh, have a lot of energy and they're also easy to ignite. Uh, the same cannot be said for boron. Uh, boron has extremely high energy per unit volume, uh, but unfortunately, pure boron is extremely difficult to ignite. Uh, but it's attractive uh, because of its high energy. And so about every 10 years, there's research uh, onto the ignition and combustion on boron, and they invariably uh, come to the same conclusion that uh, it's almost impossible to get it to ignite and burn in a timely fashion. So it, so they don't, uh, and so they don't use uh, pure boron. And so that sort of comes in cycles. Uh, and I think they're playing with basically coating the boron with various things or mixing it with various alloying agents or other things to help it uh, ignite. Um, and then aluminum particles are often used because A, they're somewhat easy to ignite uh, and they still have a whole lot of energy. And then also um, you also see uh, titan uh, titanium particles being used. <clears throat> um, uh, uh, yeah, titanium particles being used and um, and tungsten looks attractive, but that's only because uh, if, from a from a from a volumetric standpoint. But that's only because tungsten is a crazy heavy metal. Uh, per unit mass, it doesn't have a whole a a uh, a whole lot of oxidation energy. But anyway, so we could sort of go through all these sort of solid compounds uh, and just sort of see uh, and sort of see that all these are 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 effective additives. Um, that can be considered and you'll sometimes see silicon uh like sort of like even silicon being used in titanium uh and tungsten is used for other reasons because it is extremely heavy uh, there are some advantages to using tungsten at least in an explosive application um and so uh even iron burns um if any of you who if any of you have used a grinder and you see those sparks flying that's actually burning iron and so, um, and so, if you were to look at the filings from uh, from a grinder, uh, they are they are they are not pure iron. They're actually a form of, of of iron oxide, and that's the reason that they spark so long is is that they're actually burning as they're flying through the air. And so, uh, and so, even iron burns. <clears throat> so, but it's too heavy to be to be practically used in a uh, in a propellant or an explosive. Okay, but yeah, the poster child uh, is aluminum, uh, not because. And I know in the DO, in the DO, in the DOE and uh, and DOD labs, uh, they look at all sorts of other alloying agents. But at least in academia, uh, aluminum is the poster child because it is very well characterized, uh, and its combustion behavior is publicly available, uh, and all sorts of other stuff. Uh, a, a lot of the new fancy uh, reactive materials. Uh, which include alloying agents and all sorts of thermites and crazy things like that. Uh, they are not in the uh, they are not in the open. Even their even their formulation is not in the open, and so we obviously can't discuss that stuff. And I don't even know it. I don't even know it anyways. So, but anyways, so right. yeah. When choosing the type of metal, is it better to have it like more energy per mass or per volume? Uh, it depends on your application. Okay. Uh, if it's an explosive, you can be volume limited. Uh, okay. But if it's a but if it's if it's a rocket, you you need to be concerned about both mass and volume. Okay. Right. Because uh, you could have you could add lots of energy, uh, but then if the if the propellant is sort of too heavy that uh, uh, that 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 uh, that that your rocket can't even lift off, then it's effectively useless. And so. Uh, it really depends on the application. Uh, if it's you know if it's volume limited, you know basically meaning that your your design criterion is that you have x amount of space to work with, and you can put whatever you want in that volume, then you are more concerned with the per unit volume. Uh, but if it's a rocket, you're concerned with both. Um, okay. And and real quick, were these were these experimental values or are these theoretical values? Those are theoretical, but again, this is just chemical e chemical equilibrium type of analysis. Got it. Okay, thank you. Yep. And generally, the experiments and the chemical equilibrium analysis they will not be that far off. 
uh, from from uh, each other. Say like if you used a bomb calorimeter or something like that. Okay, and then um, and then metal particles, as I said, are often added to propellants uh, due to their really high energy content or relative to just a normal fuel. Um, and also the fact that they burn in typical hydrocarbon combustion products. Uh, you know, CH, uh, uh, or you can say, or CHNOEMs. Because uh, remember that the stable combustion products of RDX or rocket propellants or explosives are still your typical water vapor, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, et cetera. Etc. And then some smaller fragments. Uh, you know, if you do a, a very formalized chemical e equilibrium uh, analysis. And so a, another reason that these that these metal additives are added is that they can burn with those combustion products. So you could have aluminum burning with the water uh, burning uh, burning with the water vapor to produce Al2O3 uh, plus hydrogen. So if we were to draw a picture of a burning of a burning propellant, is that we could have the actual we could have the actual uh, the actual propellant flame here, and then the then after the final combustion products here, you'd see that the aluminum particles would basically burn after that, and so it really adds a lot of heat release to your system. And it may or may not add to the burning rate of the propellant, uh, depending on how close uh, the uh, uh, depending on how physically close the flame is to the propellant surface. Basically, if it's close enough to influence the heat flux to the surface, then the burning aluminum particles can increase the burning rate. And so, if you use nano-sized aluminum particles, uh, they burn so fast that they can actually add to the heat flux to the uh, to the burning propellant. If you use if you use the bigger ones, uh, then they don't, but they still add energy to the rocket system itself. So they so so they still burn. And so this reaction here is highly exothermic, and it's also producing a uh, a lot of really light gas. So if you think about what the specific thrust is for a rocket, ISP, uh, it's going to scale with the square root of the adiabatic flame temperature of your propellant divided by the molecular weight of the of the products. So the final combustion products that are being dumped out of your nozzle, uh, A, the burning of the metal particles is going to increase the flame temperature further uh, from about 2,500 Kelvin to about uh, between 3,000 and 3,500 Kelvin. Uh, if you compare a non-aluminized propellant to an aluminized propellant, and also it's going to take heavy. It's going to take this heavy water, and it's going to convert it to hydrogen. And Al2O3 is a solid, so that doesn't factor into this. And so it's so the burning of the aluminum particles in a rock propellant simultaneously increases the flame temperature, and decreases the molecular weight of the products. And so it's sort of a double whammy uh, in terms of the specific thrust. Again, that's a very hand wavy. Uh, and the uh, it's sort of very hand wavy reasoning, uh, and there are other more subtle reasons for sort of uh, for adding uh, like metallized particles uh, into a rocket propellant. Okay, and so almost all decently burning metals burn in CO two and H two O, and you can also use in any you can also use that fact uh, to add a, a bit of oomph to uh, to uh, explosive charges too. Uh, and there are various configurations with that. Uh, you can mix the aluminum particles inside the charge. You know, you can mix it with the explosive itself. You can put them in a shell uh, around the a, around the outside. And doing all those different uh, sort of design aspects give you a completely different uh, effects that the you know uh, that then uh, that then the military can use for their various applications. Okay. So, are there any questions as to why? Uh, these why why these metal particles are basically used in 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 as an additive to energetic materials. Just a question about that that burning time. Is there some sort of non-dimensional time or distance that you would like those particles to burn by to add optimal ISP to the system? Because I could think of a time you know a scenario where they burn so far away that they're not 
being as effective as they could be? Well, to add energy to the rock, you know, to the inside of the combustion chamber, uh, you want them, to, you know, the largest amount of time you would, you, you would want them to take the burn would be the time that it takes for them to basically travel between uh, their, the sort of propellant surface where they emerged uh, to the rocket nozzle. Anything after the rocket nozzle is not going to help the thrust. And so that would be your sort of, your sort of, your sort of ultimate time scale. Uh, you know, like that would be your absolute longest aim on a time that you, that you would want them to burn. Uh, but then if you want them to burn fast enough to help the burning of the propellant, then that's a whole different issue. Then they need to burn in a time scale that is comparable to the gas uh, in like the fizz layer and things like that. And so, uh, and so it all depends on what you're after with it. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Yep. <clears throat> Um, professor, how do you how do you balance the amount of metal particles? Like, how do you how do you calculate between like, uh, um, the optimal amount of metal metal particles you should add to any given fuel? Uh, that gets pretty complicated because the products are, uh, because the products are uh either a molten or solid aluminum oxide, i.e., slag. Uh, if you melt aluminum you'll see this sort of, uh, these sort of solid little things floating to the top. Uh, that's, that, that is this right here. Uh, and basically that is a complete loss in, in your rocket. Uh, say you are in the space shuttle rocket booster and your nozzles will actually look, it's, a, it's called what's, what's, it's called a submerged nozzle. Uh, and that, let's see the nozzle, what that looked like like this, I'm gonna have to, I'm really bad at drawing, so it's an asshole. Can flip this. Nope. Sorry, the stream like this. Okay, I did a little bit better than I thought. So here is your rocket nozzle. The uh, the combustion chamber of the rocket would basically be would basically be right here. And what will happen is this Al two O three it'll form a liquid slag uh, that will accumulate in this sort of submerged portion of the nozzle right here. It will basically freeze onto the surface of the freeze onto the surface of your nozzle. And so even the question as how much to put in. Uh, is a very open question because also if you add too many particles, uh, there are so many of them to basically heat up that they start to reduce the performance of the rocket, and so that gets that's part of the magic uh, of these propellant formulations and why there's so much trial and error and why even though almost all propellants have you know almost the same the same ingredients, um, but it's how they're mixed, it's the size distributions of the aluminum particles of the AP. It's basically all those details basically goes into its performance and how it, and how uh, it performs. And so, if you consider a real rocket, there are a lot of considerations uh, aside from just the burning of the propellant. Is you got to think of where are those products going to go and, and basically what and basically what phase are they in? Because uh, um, one of my colleagues was looking at rocket nozzle uh, erosion. Ideally, in your mind, the rocket nozzle is stays at a constant diameter. But um, there can be, uh, you have a very hot and uh, oxidizing environment. Uh, steam will also uh, react with carbon. So if you have a carbon, a, a carbon phenolic nozzle, uh, the, the combustion products of the propellant will basically eat it away. If you have this alumina, uh, which is what this is, this alumina slag, uh, that can freeze onto the surface uh, and part heat, which then will cause uh, the rocket nozzle to devolatilize and produce, you know, uh, produce gas and, and uh, erode away. So there really is no easy answer to that question. Uh, it just depends on specifics. Okay. So um, with regards to the submerged portion of the nozzle, do they, is that purposely to catch the slag or is that uh so for something else and the slag just happens to accumulate there? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, okay. 
Yeah, yeah. I don't know the answer to that question. I just know that they were looking at um, that Drew uh, when he when he was at the lab. He was mimicking uh, the submerged portion of the nozzle and the nozzle itself. Okay. So before we get going crazy with the metal particle combustion, uh, let's just review the evaporation of a single droplet. And so what we will consider is really what the question we are going to ask is how long does it take uh, this, uh, this fuel droplet? Uh, it could be molten aluminum and aluminum does burn after it melts. And so it's a droplet uh, when it burns, how long? If there's, if there's no combustion, how long does it take this droplet to vaporize? Uh, how long does it live? And what's the sort of flow structure around the droplet? And um, then it turns out that the same analysis uh, can be applied uh, to a burning droplet with almost uh, within the final result has, a, has basically very little change. And so in this analysis, we will assume quasi steady flow. That is, we are assuming that at any instant of time, even though this droplet is shrinking as basically more and more mass is vaporized, the speed at which the surface is receding is extremely small. And so that at, at, at any radius, we can treat the gas phase region uh, uh, on the outside of the droplet uh, as, as, uh, 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 as a steady flow field. Okay, and so that's called, and so that's called quasi-steady, meaning that we're gonna treat it as if it's steady, but in reality, it's not quite steady, uh, but it is just about steady. Uh, we'll assume constant pressure, constant properties. Uh, there are, there's be no reactions for basically this analysis here. We're only gonna consider the gas phase side out here. Uh, we'll assume the droplet is stationary and we will assume that fixed law is valid. And so remember when we were discussing diffusion velocities and things like that, and so the fixed laws, uh, so if you use fixed law, the diffusion velocity of the fuel is just minus uh, of, uh, of the diffusion coefficient divided by the, by the fuel mass fraction uh, times the gradient of uh, 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 the gradient of the fuel mass fraction. Okay, and then we will also assume that the Lewis number, uh, which is equal to uh, the thermal diffusivity divided by the mass diffusivity uh, is equal to one. Okay, and so I know it's been a while since we talked about diffusion velocities and Lewis numbers, um, but but for combustion they're pretty important concepts, uh, and so uh, so it's sort of good that uh, we get to sort of uh, use them before the end of the class. Okay, and so we can show um, that under these assumptions, uh, the species mass equation for the gas phase. Uh, becomes again assuming spherical 1D, and I'm not going to start with the full species mass uh, equation and then convert it to 1D spherical coordinates. Um, many of you are advanced graduate students, so I would expect uh, you know that you would know how to do that. You know, if I gave you a table of operators, uh, you would know how to go from the full transient, um, general, the full transient compressible general version. Uh, to this version here. And I've done similar operations uh, a couple of other times for a couple of different applications. Okay, so basically this is what conservation of mass becomes where we have, uh, where we have this R squared uh, rho, uh, and then that's the gas phase density. Should probably put rho G here just to be safe, times the, times the gas phase velocity leaving the surface, times the uh, 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 times the uh, times the watch we call it uh, times the gradient of the mass fraction. So this here is just the convection of the uh, of the vapor mass out, and this here is just the diffusion of the vapor mass. Okay, and so over here, this looks like uh, this looks complicated because we have r squared, we have u, and we have rho. Again, we're assuming constant properties, so rho is just constant. And we're assuming constant properties, so D is constant. Uh, in general, you can note that rho D is, is, is essentially constant uh, for a lot of applications. You'll see that not rho or D is constant, but they will assume that rho times D is constant. And so you'll see that done quite a bit in, uh, uh, in combustion. Okay. 
And so now first we can start to use conservation of mass to simplify this term. And if we assume steady state uh, conditions, I can use conservation of mass on any annular shell that I want. So if I pick a control volume, this looks like an egg, but it's supposed to be a circle. Again, I'm not an artist. Um, so if I pick a control volume and it's an annular region between two arbitrary radii of the sphere, uh, you can show that under steady uh, conditions that basically no matter what I pick R1 and R2 to be, as long as they're both in the gas phase side, you can show uh, that, basically, that basically R squared rho of the gas uh, times the velocity is equal to a constant. Okay, and since it's equal to a constant, we can just say that this is equal to uh, the radius of the droplet Rs, or where, where S means surface, uh, times the gas phase density, times the gas phase uh, velocity at the surface. And this, and this US, um, I know we've mentioned it before in that one homework problem, uh, that's called the Stefan velocity. And so you could think of as the droplet is vaporizing, there is a sort of blowing velocity of gas that is sort of flowing away from the surface. Okay, and basically that's just caused by, uh, by the vapor mass sort of just leaving the surface. Okay, because it has to go somewhere. And it's changing its density by about a factor of 1000. So there is an expansion. So that means there is a flow induced by the vaporization. Okay, and then that's, that is usually called the Stefan or, or the blowing velocity. And then in a homework problem, uh, you found that the vaporization mass flux, uh, omega dot double prime F uh, was equal to this expression here. Okay, and so uh, you guys solve that problem, which I need to grade the homework to. Um, you guys solve that problem uh, and found that it's equal to this expression here, where this cap VFS is the diffusion velocity. And if we assume Ficke and mass diffusion, uh, where we have this expression here, we can take this and substitute it into here. Then we find that the vaporization mass flux is just equal to this. Then if we assume that the droplet is perfectly stationary, we can show uh, using control volumes uh, that, the, that the vaporization mass flux is just simply equal to the velocity at the surface of the droplet uh, times the gas phase density. And then we can basically substitute this into here and solve for our velocity at the surface. Okay, so are there any questions with that? Okay, so we could go and substitute this in, uh, but that would sort of make things quite a, quite a big mess. And what DB Spalding, um, for those of you who've taken CFD, uh, you may have heard that name, it's the same guy. Uh, DB, uh, DB Spalding was one of the folks who uh, pioneered um, uh, a, a sort of, uh, a, you know, he pioneered various solvers for CFD and he was actually more of a combustion scientist. Uh, but if you took CFD, you, uh, you may have heard his name uh, or you may not have heard his name. But anyways, he defined a parameter, a small b, that's defined as the fuel mass fraction divided by, uh, the, by, the, by, the, by, the, by the mass fraction of fuel at the surface minus one. Remember comma S, means that we are we are at the surface if there's no comma s that means we are at any radius that we want to evaluate it and this is this really defined as the mass fraction of fuel at any radius divided by the mass fraction of all the other species at the surface other than the fuel and that's basically what this is saying here and it's and it's, it's defined to be the negative of that and also uh just because uh, this here is just a constant and so this means that DB is equal to DYF, okay? And so, um, and so what we can do then is A, we can greatly simplify this nasty expression here for basically these, uh, for the Stefan velocity. 
using uh, 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 by using our small b definition. And now that just becomes the, uh, the mass diffusivity uh, times the gradient of b at the surface of the droplet. Okay. And then we can also work with the species mass equation itself and convert the gradients of the mass fraction to the gradients of b by just basically changing yf to b. And then we get this expression here. Again, it's not horribly different. Um, we just changed yf to b. It just looks like we just took one variable and changed it into another variable uh, at this point here. And so, uh, and unless you've seen the full analysis, you may be wondering why did we go through it and waste our time with that? Uh, but it does help out later on. Okay, and then also we have the boundary condition. Uh, A, we have the boundary condition at the surface defined by this. And also if we're very far away from the surface, um, we know we need to know what the fuel vapor or what the fuel vapor mass fraction is, and I'm going to define that to be the fuel vapor mass fraction at at infinity, uh, which for a say if you're evaporating a droplet of water uh, in your house or something like that, that would typically that would typically be zero, but it's not always zero. Um, also, this sort of analysis also works for condensation. And so that is if you have the vapor mass fraction uh, far away from the droplet being uh, being very high, you uh, uh, you can actually transfer mass to the droplet, and then this Diffond velocity points towards the droplet instead of away from the droplet. Okay, and so we'll just define that the mass fraction far away from the or from the droplet is basically yf uh, infinity. And this implies that uh, that basically that b is equal to some d infinity, uh, which is defined using this uh, expression here. Okay, and just remember, uh, this doesn't look like it's constant, but but conservation of mass says that is it is indeed constant. Okay, so this is constant, uh, this is constant, and so we now have um, a nice separable a second order ODE, and we can just solve by more or less integrating twice and applying the boundary conditions. So we're going to integrate the first time uh, by just doing a very straightforward integral. And remember that this is constant. And so uh, if we integrate this, we get this expression here. We have R U squared times UG times B is equal to uh, this stuff inside of this, uh, inside of this derivative here, uh, plus some integration constant. So for here, uh, to, uh, 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 to find C1, uh, it's most straightforward to use our first boundary condition uh, at the surface of the droplet. And that would be that the that this Diffond velocity is equal to the mass diffusivity uh, times the gradient of our small b parameter. OK, and so if we apply that and evaluate this expression, at the surface of the droplet. And so we have basically BS, <laughs> BS, um, anyways, sorry, that was the 13 year old me uh, sort of chuckling at that. Um, and we also have this uh, D times uh, DB uh, DR at the surface, and that's just US. And so this here, when you evaluate it at the surface, just becomes US. Okay. And so we can then solve uh, for our integration constant, and we find that uh, it is this this expression here. So it, it's R S rho G U S times um, times B at the surface uh, minus one. Okay, and so we can take this and substitute it back into uh, uh, our our uh, our once integrated uh, uh, a boundary value problem. And then, um, and then when we do that, we wind up with this expression here. Again, I'm just marking all the things that are constant because at first glance, they don't look like they're constant. Because remember, this is constant uh, and rho d is also constant. Okay, and basically all I've done to go from here, or I mean from here to here was I substituted in and simplified uh, the result for the integration constant. Okay. And since this is a nice uh, separable first order ODE, we can separate 
uh, r from uh, r from b, and then integrate. Okay. Then if we integrate, we find a uh, very straightforward integral. We find that minus rs squared times us over rd is equal to the natural log of b minus b at the surface plus one uh, plus c2. Now we apply uh, now we apply our far field boundary condition at r equals infinity, and that equals b at infinity, and so we can find um, basically at r equals to infinity, this term here goes away because again this here is just a constant, and r approaches infinity and d is just a constant, so that means as r approaches in infinity this term here uh, approaches zero. And then basically we can just we, we we can substitute in b infinity here, and then very straightforwardly solve for c two, and then substitute that in. Okay, so we do that, and when we substitute in the result uh, for c two, uh, and just use properties of logs and simplify, uh, we wind up with this expression right here. And I took the minus sign here, and I basically use it to flip our 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 to flip the numerator and the denominator, the denominator of the natural logarithm. Okay, so what we have here is basically RS or the, the, the droplet radius squared times the Stefan velocity uh, divided by RD at, uh, at any radius um, is equal to the natural logarithm of this ratio here. Okay, and so, um, and so to this point, are there any questions? Okay, so it's all compared to some of compared to some of the other stuff we have messed around with. Uh, because we're assuming everything is constant, um, or almost everything is constant, is actually pretty straightforward. It's actually probably actually more difficult to derive that weird boundary condition for the vaporization mass flux than anything else. Uh, but anyways, so we, what we want is the evaporation mass flux, because uh, again, that's going to be coupled to uh, Again, that is coupled to the gradient of B at the surface. So what we need to do is we need to take this expression here and evaluate it at the surface. Okay, and so at the surface, B is equal to B at the surface or, or BS. Okay, and so we evaluate this expression at the surface. So R becomes RS. And so basically, uh, basically those cancel out. And then uh, this here uh, B, uh, would be BS minus BS, that goes away. And so, and so the denominator just simply becomes one. And so basically we have this expression here. That's actually, that's actually fairly simple. We just have uh, basically this ratio here is equal to the natural logarithm of one plus the quantity B infinity minus B at the surface. Okay, and then uh, Spalding, uh, define this uh, define this difference here to be a capital B, and that capital B is called a, a Spalding transfer number. Uh, and there are several Spalding transfer numbers uh, depending on which equation you are working with. Uh, and so this here will be BM, and that is a Spalding transfer number based on mass transfer. Okay, and so B, or I should say BM. Uh, for vaporization or pure vaporization, no combustion is equal to B at infinity minus B at the surface. And if we use the definition of small b, uh, we, we, uh, we, we wind up with this uh, expression right here. Okay. So then uh, using the definition of the Spalding transfer number, uh, we know then that basically RS times US is equal to the mass, uh, to the diffusion coefficient uh, times times the, the natural logarithm of one uh, plus the Spalding transfer number. Okay, so finally, so we got everything in terms of a nice constant. Uh, we've taken some messy uh, expressions and simplified them down. And then finally, we can, uh, we can find what the, what the evaporation mass flux is. And for whatever reason in droplet combustion literature, they call that GF, uh, they just do. And that's just the that's just that's just the total mass transfer rate from the droplet uh, divided by uh, uh, divided by the surface area, 
that's also equal to the gas phase density uh, times the Stefan velocity. And so we can basically uh, solve this expression here for the Stefan velocity uh, and then basically substitute and basically substitute that in. And so basically here, what we have here is that the evaporation that the evaporation mass flux uh, is equal to uh, the gas phase density. Uh, times the diffusion coefficient uh, evaluated at the surface if it does happen to be variable uh, divided by the radius times the natural log of one plus the Spalding transfer number. Now notice here that this expression for uh, the vaporization mass flux uh, gets or gets larger and larger and larger uh, the smaller the droplet gets. Uh, and that is, and, and that basically has to do with the fact that as the droplet gets smaller and smaller and smaller, the sort of length scales for diffusion, that is the length scale that, that, uh, that the fuel vapor has to leave the droplet before it's sort of considered to be far away, uh, gets smaller and smaller uh, uh, and smaller. And some of you may be thinking like, wait, isn't this going to approach infinity? as uh, the droplet, uh, if you have a like nano-sized droplet, isn't this going to be crazy high? And does the theory break down? And the answer to those questions is yes. Um, because we are in, under those conditions, uh, I implicit in our derivation of this equation right here, we are assuming that the vapor mass fraction at the surface is always at the saturation uh, condition. But in reality, and uh, this will be part of a homework problem, but in reality, the vapor, need, the vapor needs to be generated at the surface first and then diffused away. And the rate of vapor generation at the surface is given by that schrage newton equation uh, that I derived, or that I didn't derive, uh, that I showed you a long time ago. And so essentially the total rate of vaporization is basically limited uh, by, by, by the slower of those two processes, whether it's how fast the, uh, uh, how fast, uh, the vapor can be sort of uh, generated at the surface at the molecular level, or how fast it can be transported away, is that the total rate of vaporization will be dominated by the slower of, of those two processes. For most droplets under most conditions, this is by far the slower of the two operations or uh, of those two processes. But as the droplet becomes smaller and smaller and smaller, um, it becomes that sort of vapor generate uh, that 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 vapor that vapor generation process. Um, and then when we do metal particle uh, combustion, uh, we see a very similar uh, uh, effect uh, for nano drop or, or for nano aluminum particle combustion in that the burning rate uh, becomes not, it, it, it becomes limited by a different uh, phenomenon, uh, chemical kinetics rather than diffusion. And so, uh, and so there are analogies between, between this vaporization and combustion for metal particles, okay? Now, so if you wanna evaluate the, the sort of the vaporization mass flux, uh, all, these are, all, all these are constants and we know that, but we need to find the Spalding transfer number. And so, and to evaluate that, we don't really know enough uh, because we need to know what the, we need to, we need to know what the, we need to know uh, what the saturation mass fraction is of vapor at the surface. And we don't know that. Uh, and so that is, and so that is tied, uh, that is tied to uh, the surface temperature. If, if you remember the sort of saturation vapor curve is basically if we are as, assuming that the surface of the liquid is, is, is at a saturated uh, condition, then basically we need to know that we also need to know the surface temperature. And we don't know that a priori, uh, and we can't just determine what that is, is that it's basically coupled. And so I'm not gonna show it, but if you, if you examine the energy equation, you can show that Rs times Us is equal to alpha S times the natural logarithm of one 
plus the specific heat times delta T uh, uh, between the far field and the surface times the latent heat of vaporization. And so this here is you can work with the energy equation, assume constant everything, and you wind up with another Spalding transfer number. This here is called BT because it's the Spalding transfer number based on the temperature equation. Okay. And then also, so we have RS times US is equal to this expression here in terms of in terms of BT. And we also had that RS times US is equal to uh, is equal to the fusion coefficient times uh, 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 times the Spalding transfer times the Spalding transfer coefficient based on uh, based on the species mass equation. And so basically, these two here are equal. And furthermore, if we assume that the Lewis number is equal to one, which means that alpha is equal to D, then these cancel out. And then we can conclude that the, that the Spalding transfer number based on temperature and the Spalding transfer number based on mass are the same. And so this gives us a relationship that we can solve for the surface temperature uh, and the surface mass fraction. Okay, now there is one slight problem here in the sense that we, uh, we have one equation and, uh, and then two unknowns, but you can get the other, uh, you, you can get the other uh, equation uh, based on thermodynamics or data on, or data that relates the, uh, that, that relates the saturation pressure of the liquid as a function of temperature. And so for those of you um, using nitromethane for project two, uh, you, are basically, you are basically using a correlation for that. Uh, uh, in thermodynamics, if you took advanced thermal, you may have learned something called the clausius clapeyron equation. You can use that uh, to, sort of, uh, to sort of relate the partial pressure of vapor at the surface uh, to the surface temperature. Or if you have access to data, it's often correlated in a form called the Antoni uh, equation, which you can get online from from the NIST chem, uh, from the NIST chemical from the NIST chemical webbook uh, or Dipper, uh, which you which you have to pay for Dipper. But uh, Dipper is a gigantic book about that big that has data on just about every fluid you could possibly think of. It even had data on the speed of sound of liquid molten aluminum. So it had data on just about everything that uh, 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 that you can think of. And then, so, so these relate the partial pressure of the, of the fuel vapor to the, to this, to the surface temperature. Um, and note that if there is an ideal gas, you can relate uh, the surface mass fraction to the partial pressure of the surface uh, by just using the ideal gas mixing rules. Okay. Then you now have two equations, two variables. You can solve for, um, you can solve for the surface mass fraction, the surface temperature, then you can find uh, uh, the sort of uh, the uh, the sort of vaporization, uh, uh, basically mass burning rate. Okay. Okay, and so we will pick up on Monday as to basically how we use this, uh, how we use this sort of m m uh, m uh, m dot f, and if you use m dot f and you do a, a transient control volume analysis. Uh, on the droplet itself, we will derive something what's called the celebrated D squared law uh, for droplet vaporization. Okay, and so uh, that is it uh, for today. Are there any questions? Okay, there are no questions, then we will uh, see you on Monday.